Maharashtra Industrial Development Corporation, the one single window in the state to kickstart your industry. And don't take my word for it. See all who have come here and flourished. The facts are before you. The answer is staring at your face. Are we still thinking? Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, the film shows why Maharashtra Mumbai is one of the most favored destinations for investment, not only in India, but one of the most favored destinations for entire Asia. Thank you very much for any further inquiry. We are available here throughout the day. We have a stall down here. So all inquiries are most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gagrani, for, for presenting magnetic Maharashtra with excellent infrastructure facilities, including land, power, connectivity, water, lifestyle, labor, and much more. Professor Usha Haley will be chairing this session. There is a small change. So could I invite her for the opening remarks as well as her presentation? <clears throat> Thanks. Well, it's good to be in Mumbai, the place of my birth. And I'm going to be talking today about trade and the need for fair trade, not just free trade. I'm going to be drawing on some of the research that George and I have done, published by Oxford University Press in a book called Subsidies to Chinese Industry, and also on the work that we do for the United States Congress, where we both advise on trade. George and I also advised, have advised major industries, such as the solar industry and the steel industry in China, uh, on China trade, and our research has been made into regulation, both in the European Union and the United States. And that's some of these issues that I'll be speaking about today. I've also just been told that I'm chairing the session, so I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to keep you on track as well. Over the last five years, China has moved from net importer to largest manufacturer and largest exporter in capital intensive industries in which it enjoyed no comparative advantage just a few years ago. Over the course of these five years, industrialized countries have become primarily exporters of scrap and commodities to China. But it's not just industrialized countries, it's also industrializing countries such as India. The effects on business strategy and national competitive advantage have been immense. But economic theories offer very little insight into the subsidies that have propelled Chinese business in just a few years. Economic studies have very rarely studied subsidies. And when they have, they have portrayed them primarily as distortions. Manufacturing subsidies, they say, redistribute and reallocate resources according to non-market criteria that result in an inefficient allocation of these resources. When economists have studied subsidies, they have argued that subsidies hurt the subsidizing country but benefit consumers. But that is not the new reality. And that certainly isn't how the Chinese government views subsidies. China's state capitalism regime has viewed subsidies as conceptions of control to advance the governments and the Communist Party of China's political, social, economic, and diplomatic goals. The government has willingly paid the cost of economic inefficiencies to advance the CPC's goals. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the India-China trade imbalance. I'm going to be speaking about capitalism with Chinese characteristics, 
subsidies to steel and auto parts, major industries for, the, for India, as well as for the United States. And then I'm going to talk about some trade policy questions that we can address. Within just a few years, China has become India's major trading partner. <coughs> Excuse me. The relationship is unequal, with India being in debt to China. Here's an example of that. So what does India export to China, and what does China export to India? China exports to India industrialized and finished products, such as telecom equipment, computer peripherals, finished iron and steel goods, etc. And India exports to China commodities. What is capitalism with Chinese characteristics? Now, state capitalism refers to a situation where states play significant and visible roles in markets. There are two dimensions to state capitalism, the extent of the state's ownership of production and the extent of the state's coordination with other enterprises. China uniquely synchronizes party, government, military, and the economy. The state freely creates enterprises and manages them. It holds a majority of shareholdings in those enterprises. It controls critical personnel, and it makes decisions on those personnel. And it supplies capital to SOE, state-owned enterprises, who in the ultimate are responsible and owe their allegiance to the state and not to any shareholders. Control of capital is very important in this situation, but the Chinese control all capital. They, they control all the major financial institutions, and the state council's vice premier manages all the major banks. The flows of capital from the government to industry are extremely important, but very poorly understood. And so George and I, we did some industry studies, which I'm going to be talking about today. Ultimately, China is a multi-organizational state, where the provinces and the center often compete, but this is not really visible from the outside. We found out in our research that the power of the state is expanding in China. If you look at fixed asset investment, it started out from about 24% of GDP in 1990 to over 70% of GDP today. But also, the ratio of private to government consumption has been falling. The state has become the largest consumer. I'm going to be talking today about flows of capital to industries that we've studied. We've looked at subsidies, which are transfers from the government to private to enterprises, not just private, but state-owned enterprises as well. And we looked at subsidies to steel, glass, paper, auto parts, and the solar PV industry. All of these were capital-intensive manufacturing industries with labor about 2 to 7% of total costs, not just in China, but around the world. These were fragmented industries with no economies of scale or scope, and they were geographically fragmented as well, with every province having an industry. And yet prices were 25 to 30% lower than the United States and the European Union. So what were these subsidies? They were free or low-cost loans that never had to be paid for the life of that loan. There were subsidies to energy where the companies received free electricity, coal, and natural gas. There were subsidies to inputs, including soda ash, pulp, recycled paper, glass, cold rolled steel, as well as free land and free technology. We measured what we could measure, but this was literally the tip of the iceberg. So I'm thinking we measured maybe one-tenth of what was actually there, but then again, that is a guess. By our estimates, subsidies comprised about one-third of the industrial output of these strategically important industries. 
Let me talk a little bit about steel, an important industry for the United States as well as for India and certainly for China. Steel is a pillar industry and foreign investment is not allowed or very, very strictly controlled. In 2014, China is the largest producer and consumer of steel with about 50% of production, up from 16% in 1999. In 2005, China went from net steel importer to steel exporter. In in, remember in 2001, China joined the WTO and ramped up subsidies to its industry. In 2006, China became the largest steel exporter. In 2007, it became the largest steel producer. Steel making capacity more than doubled from 2005 to 2012 and is continuing to grow. We just looked at energy subsidies. From 2000 to 2006, energy subsidies grew by 1,365%, and total energy subsidies from 2000 to mid-2000 were 27.11 billion. Yet steel in China is a fragmented industry. There is not a consolidated industry, and every province has a steel industry. Here is an example of the way steel subsidies have, energy subsidies to steel have grown. And it was about 27.1 billion over the course that we studied. That is from 2000 to 2007 mid-year. We just looked at subsidies to coking coal, thermal coal, electricity, and natural gas. But these subsidies correlated with the increase in production and the increase of Chinese exports of steel. What were the results? Massive excess capacity in China with supply exceeding demand on average by 20% every year. And yet new capacity was added in China larger than the total output of the second largest producer of steel in the world, Japan. That is the new capacity exceeded the total production capacity of Japan. From 2000 to, two, to the present day, the United States has had a trade deficit with China on steel for every year except 2003. In 2012, the United States trade deficit was 142% greater than in 2000. Chinese steel costs were still between 20 and 30% less than the US or EU, depressing steel prices worldwide. From 2009, the US and the EU have filed trade complaints and slapped tariffs against China. I want to talk a little bit about autos. By the way, feel free to cut me short if I'm exceeding 15 minutes. Raise your hand or something to that effect. I might ignore you. Sorry? I know, but I'm, I don't, I'm not really timing myself. If you could just cut me short, that'd be helpful. OK. So autos is a pillar industry for China, and each and the center and 24 provinces have an auto industry. Auto parts make up 70% of the cost of an auto. China is one of the largest auto parts producers in the world, with exports to the United States about a third of production. I'm going to talk about autos, auto parts because auto parts is also an important industry for India. Chinese policy is focused on acquisition and development of new energy and green technologies. And it's a highly fragmented industry, again, with no economies of scale. Uh, 10,000 registered and 15,000 unregistered manufacturers. And we calculated that from 2001 to 2011, that industry received at least 28 billion in subsidies, with 11 billion for restructuring and technology development. And that, again, is just the tip of the iceberg. As you can see, this has contributed to the growth of the auto parts industry. It has grown by more than 150% since 2003 in China. China is a net importer of auto parts from every major auto automaker except the United States, where it runs, the United States runs a trade deficit in auto parts with China, and that is because of the strategies followed by the major automakers in the United States. And of course, the United States, like most other countries, including India, has a huge trade imbalance with China, the largest that any country has had with any other country in the history of the world. Okay. We calculated that from 2000 to 2011, the Chinese subsidized that auto industry by at least 28 billion, with another 11 billion for restructuring and technological development in, planned for the next decade. And what has the results of this been? Well, 
the Chinese have policies in place, such as indigenous innovation, where you have to transfer your technology to a Chinese company in order to access the market. And this has contributed to higher value-added Chinese production. There have been major technology transfer issues with companies voicing concerns, including through the American Chamber of Commerce. There have been numerous trade issues with the United States, and these concern branding, as well as violations of the WTO regulations and on new energy vehicles. There have been numerous provincial disputes with provinces competing for investments and technology and pretty much slapping each other in order to gain an upper hand. Okay. Some of the trade policy questions I hope that we can discuss is, well, I did talk about our research being used to, to levy tariffs against Chinese imports, but how have they actually affected Chinese imports U.S. employment or U.S. manufacturing. What incentivizes Chinese production exports? It certainly isn't efficiencies. And how can foreign governments affect Chinese provincial production? Finally, since we all, we all admit that we're in a globalized economy, how can globalized supply chains be addressed in order for, to ex extract the most, most efficiencies in what is an inefficient and politically driven environment? Thank you.